You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. Hi, welcome to the show. This is Mark. I just saw that superhero movie, Black Panther, and it's good. You've probably seen it because it seems as though a lot of people bought tickets. This theater was sold out. There are multiplexes where there are 10 theaters, and they're all showing Black Panther. So it's definitely a phenomenon, which is why I wanted to see it. I'm not really necessarily a superhero movie guy as much. We talk about that a little in this episode. But more to the point, I wanted to mention something to you and see if you don't agree with me. One of the casualties of this media environment, one of the problems with media saturating us in all the different ways, is Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the different manners by which we get information is that we get expectations raised about everything, right? So when I go to the Black Panther, A, I know that the Black Panther movie has done incredible box office. It's getting insane reviews. Even the snootiest of reviewers is giving this movie great praise on every level. It's great also from just a kind of liberal perspective, and I do support minorities, and I do support those who don't have as great a voice in society, and, you know, all those things, right? So I love to see a black movie with, you know, a lot of African-American actors and the hero is a black guy and finally a black superhero you know i mean it's so it flips all those liberal switches you know but i mean it's a good movie but i'm not gonna come on here and go oh my god you've got to see black panther the expectations were raised to an unreasonable level. And that's what happens a lot during this time of Oscars. They go, oh my God, you've got to go see Three Billboards. Three Billboards, greatest movie. Whatever they say, if enough hype's behind it, when you sit there in the theater and the lights go down, I promise you'll be disappointed nine times out of ten. These expectations are raised within this media environment. And this is the world we live in now. And I think what the media environment is doing is it's generally ginning up our expectations to the point that life is going to let us down. And so when I read all these Instagram posts and Facebook posts and groups going to Black Panther and all of these things that are associated with raising my expectations for the film, of course, I'm disappointed. And this is happening across the board. When you go through Instagram and Facebook and everybody looks so happy and everybody looks so hot, beautiful, and oh my God, how come I'm not at the VIP room of whatever? It's just, it's no wonder we're all on Prozac or whatever the F we're on. That's the one thing in my life I've been able to avoid is any kind of anti-depression kind of thing. I mean, I'm not on any kind of medications. Ibuprofen is my magic medication, but I'm sure I'll be there, all of you who are on it. I mean, I'll be on this show asking you to message me the best medications for whatever letdown depression I've fallen into because my life doesn't meet the hype that I expected. Anyway, that's my more than two cents on that. Michael Shore joins us. We talk about politics. We do touch on the movie. We get to Fergie and the National Anthem, and we pack it all into 15 minutes. If your clock is a little bit slow, because I think it runs about 23 minutes. Then a man who checked out of Hollywood and moved his family to the East Coast in New England. He became a postal carrier. He completely changed his life. How did it work out? We'll find out in the second part of the show. Thanks for all the ways you support us. Thank you for going to our website, edge-show.com, shopping through the Amazon link on that page. You click on an episode, you'll see an Amazon banner. If you're going to shop Amazon anyway, click through that and you'll end up on the same Amazon. It's not more expensive, but because you click through our site, they spin us off a little something of whatever you spend. It's a way to help us keep the lights on here. Every dollar stays with the show. There's also a PayPal link on our show page at edge-show.com. You click that PayPal link and you can actually send us money. A few of you have done that, and I'm so very grateful. You know, I'm grateful for the reviews. Those of you who've left us five-star reviews and just a word or two, I check out the show when I can or I enjoy listening to it. Whatever you say, whatever you do, all the different ways you support us, I do say this every week. I mean it every week. I sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you for sharing the show as well. A few of you have done that. You can reach us at our fancy email address, edgewithmarkthompson at gmail.com. Let's get started. This is the edge. The advantage, it means. They look, I just spit on me for no reason. That's horrible. Is there some comfort in uncertainty, do you think? You're a degenerate. Because Australian shepherds need action. Wow. Yeah. This is the edge. That's a self-loathing term that I use. For oh, got it. Edge-show.com. Edge-show.com. The hyphen is stupid. Edge-show.com. Time for the Fast 15. Peace, Michael Shore. Everyone. Hey, thanks so much. 
We did a long 15 last time. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. People say to me, uh, fast 15, but like it's, sometimes it's 30 minutes, and sometimes it's like it's not really 15 minutes ever. Uh, it's ironic. That's what it is. Yeah, there's a little irony here. It's, it's uh, not literally 15. Sometimes it's 13. You just got back from taking your son to hockey. Yeah, that's not the headline here. The headline is we played in Santa Rosa, California. And Santa Rosa, for those of you who don't know, is the uh, was the adopted home of Charles M. Schultz, who created the Peanuts comic strip. Santa Rosa is about an hour north of San Francisco. Yeah, a little more, but yeah, exactly. The rink is called Snoopy's Home Ice, and it was a rink that he built with money out of his own pocket back in 1969. It couldn't have been cheap to build an ice rink. The ice has not melted since it was built. They haven't done anything. They've never melted the ice because it takes a lot to melt the ice in a rink. But anyway, he, uh, Charles Schultz loved hockey. He loved the community, and he wanted to build a place. And the rink is unbelievable. It's like a chalet of a rink. He built a restaurant called the Warm Puppy Cafe where he would go every day, have bacon and eggs for breakfast, then walk across the street to his studio and write the strip. Then he had a coronary, and he moved from bacon and eggs to an English muffin with only grape jelly every day. (laughs) And then for lunch, he would have a tuna fish sandwich every day. And he had it there, and he'd meet his friends, and he liked to watch everybody skating and having a good time. This is the guy who, at the time, in 1969, it was sort of, he was in the, the heat of his career. For sure, yeah. Peanuts, Linus, Lucy, all those exactly. characters. And across the street from the rink is the Charles M. Schultz Museum, which was where his office was. They've recreated his office. And he was just such a good guy, and his characters had such appeal, and the, the museum is fantastic. It's funny, my son's 13. Peanuts was not part of his life the way it was mine. Charlie Brown Christmas, great, where's the great pumpkin, and all of that stuff. It's gotten a little more fast and furious, as, as kids are concerned now. But it was just great to see. He introduced 50 years ago Franklin, a black character, and their letters from people who were who asked him to do it and he thought he didn't want to do it in a gratuitous oh here's a black character way help me find a way to do it and so the history of franklin himself is fantastic and everything about him uh, was was just great i'm such a fan if you're ever in that area you've got to at least go to the museum and check out the ring i love somebody who gives back to the community you know right. he did well there in that community he feels a closeness to it he loves this thing hockey and so he built this ring right that's really cool and uh, it's a charming place and the museum. Sometimes you see small museums that are dedicated to one person or one act or one piece of history and they're so much better than the big, huge museums that become overwhelming and this is one of those. You know you can bring your kids there and they'll enjoy it. Right. Let me read to you if I can indulge. This was on the wall of the museum and it was a, a poem in 1976 that his son wrote to him. It was called Little Boxes and it's one of the few things that he had on the wall in his office. It said, I salute you, speaker to the world through little boxes because that's four boxes every day was what the peanuts cartoon was i applaud your little squares a world watches and laughs with mornings with you and i share the fortune you grant us allowing a peek through your four little windows each and every day essentially and then it keep it goes on again speaker to the world through little boxes i salute you and it's just that's what he did you know he taught little lessons and made people chuckle i was never you know it was never knee slapping but right it you made know. you smile yeah sure exactly and look he did a lot of tv specials and all the rest they don't just give those to people who are I mean, no that's true and and his big thing was happiness is a warm puppy and the humane society used it for years and the name of his cafe at the rink where he ate every day was the warm puppy cafe it's really cool <laughs> yeah it really is uh well it's in beautiful and quaint areas like that all across America that there's a fear now of these mass shootings. Oh, Jesus, Mark. Wow, what a transition. I love the way Mark ties in (laughs) things that are so peaceful and happy and right. then he brings in the horror of American life. God. Not just American life, of life on this planet. That's why you come here, everybody. But uh, I don't know if anybody heard the episode last week, but I was bummed out and the situation with the mass shooting, I just thought that, you know, the, the fact that this 19-year-old, we talked about the fact that, you know, he can't get a beer, he can't vote, but he can get these assault weapons. He was identified as a guy who was trouble, that he was still able to perpetrate this heinous act. I couldn't see any good in that. And 
neither, to be fair, could you, Michael Shore, but you pointed out something as I was sort of scraping bottom of depression about it, and it was that this act was perpetrated upon teenagers. And you said that these teenagers, these high schoolers, in other words, they're going to have a voice that's even greater than we've heard before in, let's say, the wake of the Newtown shooting when right. was, everyone was six and seven yeah. years old. But I think it's also, I mean, listen, uh, 19 years ago, Columbine was perpetrated on teenagers too, but it was 19 years ago before we had Instagram and the power of Twitter and Facebook was here, but it wasn't the same. And so once it happened, if anything could change from it, because after every one of these events, we constantly say, hey, this is now, this is the one, where, you know, a congresswoman getting shot in the head, a, a, a preschool getting shot up, a, an elementary school, uh, all of that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the worst mass murder in history in Las Vegas. But this happened at a school where teenagers are able to use social media in a way that hasn't been available to people before. And because it's teenagers, I thought, well, maybe now, maybe now this mobilization where you see children who were in a school and watch their kids shot and killed who can talk about it and share it and stand up to the people that are still skeptical of their own experiences. And that's what's happened so far, you know, and now they're planning a march and their their voice is consistent and they're talking to the president who uses Twitter himself in a way that nobody has talked to the president about it before. So, you know, uh, do I think it's a slam dunk? I've thought it was before and it hasn't been, so I definitely don't. But I do think that there's something nuanced and different about it this time that may lead to some kind of advancement in gun control. I made the point before here that the NRA is a trade group. There are, they represent the interest of gun manufacturers you can't expect the NRA to step up and act responsibly to suggest gun legislation. Give me a moment about the NRA, because obviously they have great political power, more than you know, yeah. the, the plumbers union, let's say. They you know. do, and they, they have a big membership, and they have, but you know, the plumbers union, you're not gonna see them in a controversial place. They may have undue influence in Congress because the plumbers lobby in Congress may be enormous. Hey, we've gotta get copper piping. Copper piping, copper piping. What does that do? That means that plumbers all over America have to change pipes and make money all over this country because we need copper piping. I'm making that up. No, I get but, it. I but get that, it. that happens in non-sexy ways. And this, of course, the NRA is a controversial group. A, because of what they lobby for, and B, because of their power. And so they have this, you know, you say they me represent, they are a trade group, they represent gun manufacturers, but their membership is rank and file, gun owners, gun enthusiasts, hunters, etc. So they have they have two sets of appeal, and then they have a political, a political action committee that works to support candidate and issue, as we talked about last week, issue report cards. And those report cards are so important to members of Congress and people challenging them. So there's, uh, there's a lot of influence that they have across different spectrums. But because they are the NRA, their political action wing, which gives all this money to members of Congress, is not just for making sure that the business community is welcoming and good for gun manufacturers and gun, sh gun shows and people who sell weaponry, but also to make sure that laws stay in place that make it okay to have those guns. That's helping the industry. Well, their efforts to make sure that those laws stay in place, though, might they ever step up and say, hey, we support this responsible legislation on gun ownership? No. They haven't yet. 84% of their membership in polling, of, let's say it was five years ago, I don't know the exact date, was in favor of tighter gun ownership background checks. 84% of their membership, this is not 84% of the United States, the membership of the NRA, and they did nothing about it. Nothing changed. There's a cooling off period in California. The Supreme Court has said that they're not going to take a case challenging that cooling off period. That's a blow to the NRA. So when these things happen, Remington went out of business or filed for bankruptcy. When these things happen, those affect the NRA. When 84% of their membership says we want background checks, that doesn't affect the NRA. The 
NRA convention, just as a note, they have a convention in Dallas every year. And the mayor of Dallas now is asking them to have their convention somewhere else this year. That's interesting. The mayor of Dallas, uh, I don't know uh, if it's ma- the hang same. Hang on a second. If the mayor or the, I thought it was a, yeah, the mayor pro tem, Dwayne Carraway. Right. The mayor stepped down there. You'll remember there was a shooting, a mass shooting in Dallas against the yeah. police just last year. And the mayor was in the center. People were loved his response to it. It's not surprising then. It's a different <laughs> mayor. This is the mayor pro tem. But Again, it's uh, it's interesting. When's that convention? May 4th to May 6th. Yeah. It's the 147th annual meeting and exhibition. I'm sure a lot right. of business gets done Of there. course. 80,000 people show up to this thing. They can buy ammunition there, but not firearms is the, is the way it's set up. Right. You know, I think firearms can be purchased in hotel rooms and all the rest around right. the way you trade Only like- ammunition on the floor. Right. I mean, you know, my father, the late, great Michael Shore Sr., he had my favorite gun control, uh, which was uh, make firearms legal, make ammunition illegal. <laughs> Ban bullets. Uh, Somebody like- suggested making bullets really expensive. I think they really are already kind of expensive, but they meant really expensive. No. People would think twice before they right. shot up a place because it uh, costs so much. Tell me about our president. I, I know the Mueller investigation has now yielded a, some indictments. It has uh, 13 Russians, a lawyer. Uh, listen, I think that the president looked at this as a way of showing America, look, there was no collusion. It was all Russians. They would have come after us if there was collusion. You know, with 13 people, the effort, my guess, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm guessing that they're trying to get somebody of 13 to flip on the others and the Americans who helped get their involvement here. Um, And again, you know, you have Rick Gates, who's turning state's evidence now. That's probably more of a thorn in the side of Paul Manafort than it is the president. But Gates worked on the campaign with Manafort, who headed the campaign. Yes, that's right. And so, listen, this is, as we've said from the beginning, it's about a cumulative effect of things. And as you see Mueller doing this and getting indictments, I mean, this is what he had set out to look for. You'll remember Ken Starr was set out to look for a bad real estate deal on what the Clintons did, and they ended up with a a sperm-soaked blue dress. So these things take you down different paths, but part of it is still the path, right? And part of it is still that white water was nothing. Part of it is still that this Russian involvement is something, and it's something to be reacted to in a way that says, oh my God, we have to do more for to protect our elections in this country. But the president saw it as a way of exonerating himself. That had nothing to do with this. I saw an article about the fact that Russian bots jumped on the mass shooting. I mean, hours after the mass shooting, the bots were just taking over Twitter, that they love yeah. stuff like this. Right. And, and th- listen, there was a report that Michael Moore, the filmmaker, the liberal filmmaker, was attended a march to resist Trump that was organized by Russian bots. It's crazy. So this is a real issue, but it's separate from the president's dalliances and mis deeds. And it also, listen, there's some connection with Donald Trump and Russia that is untoward, it seems. And they're going to get to that. I mean, that's what they're after as well. You say that because... I say that because we haven't seen his taxes. We know that there's been Russian investment in the real estate projects that he has put forward. Uh, We know that he protects Russia at every turn. And we know that he blames Russia only for getting involved in the Democratic side of the election. So I'm just gleaning it. And I said, allegedly, or I said, we think, or I suppose, but I do. I, you know, it seems that there's some connection between Donald Trump and Russia. Might just owe them a lot of money, or they may have they essentially have financed it. He couldn't get financing anywhere else. Right. We know that. But he may be doing favor. Right. They, what you said is true. He couldn't get financing elsewhere. So he went to the Russians, got financing. We know that. That's fact. Right. There's more to it, I think. The, the whole Russian thing is weird to me. And, and it's also strange that since people of the highest levels of the intelligence community, not just one, a chorus of them now, and even independent analyses of the way that the Internet has been infiltrated by these bots and by these outside influences right. point fingers at Russia. So the idea that there would be absolutely no reaction from the U.S. government is odd. I mean, it's uh, that's the thing. It is odd. And so it, the question marks are still there. And they're a group of, uh, of men and women who go to an office every day to figure them out. And, and that's the Mueller team. And they seem to be making progress. Again, it's not going to be overnight. Even if it happened today, it wouldn't have been overnight. But it, it's, it's a long slog for these people. And they want to get it right. And everything that anybody says about Robert Mueller indicates that he is thorough and and never in a rush. He always wants to find out what the real story is to get his person. Did you see 
the superhero movie Black Panther? I did not no, but I'm going to. I'm I'm uh, I'm excited by its success. Very very big. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it it I think it's passed uh, 200 million dollars over the weekend. Right. No, it's thrilling. It's exciting. Exciting for little black kids in America who have a black superhero and that's really freaking cool. And I'm also uh, I'm not a superhero movie guy, so I'm 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 going because I want to see this, but I, you know. And no, I, I'm not a big superhero yeah. movie guy either. I'm more kind of the indie movies that are script driven or whatever. Right. The other thing about superheroes is they, there's a lot of kicking ass. You know what I mean? Right. One guy's kicking the other guy's ass yeah. and other people show up and then he has to kick their ass and they kick right. his ass in act one, but then he's going to come back and kick their asses even bigger in act three. <laughs> right. And so, then when the sequel comes out and then the sequel and the sequel. Yeah. And so the ass kicking, I just get over. Clearly targeted a different audience. Yeah. I like, couldn't we have him like be sort of nerdy and right. his right. strange knowledge of some obscure... <laughs> Couldn't the superheroes go to Rome? Right, right. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that movie's been done, but I just didn't quite get the play uh, yeah. that this one did. Anything else for us? I, you know, uh, Fergie's uh, national anthem at, at the NBA All-Star Game. Not really my domain, but I'm going to comment on it. Yeah, Fergie's national anthem took a lot of heat. I thought it was great. I didn't think it was so bad. What's the problem? Well, I don't get it. It's the national anthem, you know? it's uh, It was... It was Written by a racist. Tell us about that. Francis Scott Key. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the fourth verse of the anthem, if you can believe it, there's a fourth verse. I mean, people don't believe there's a second. Let me tell you something, dude. I only consider people patriots who do all four right. verses. <laughs> well, I, from what I remember, and this was this is unprepared, so I'd have to go back and research it a little bit. The fourth verse of the national anthem, I believe has overt racism in it. But just purely the song, I thought was terrific. I don't know. I, don't, I really don't understand why people didn't like it. And then she had to apologize for it. Also, one more thing. The Daytona 500 had its lowest ratings ever. The ratings dropped by a ton, which uh, I guess, you know, you got to blame Colin Kaepernick for that one, right? <laughs> All those people stand for the anthem. Right, right yeah. And all those people stand for the anthem, and people aren't watching yeah. because nobody's kneeling. NASCAR is so huge. I'm really surprised. Daytona's a big race. Yeah, Daytona's a big race. The uh, fourth verse of the national anthem, so those of you who are listening don't have to look it up. You're speaking of this. Am I right? No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. Slaves don't don't run away? Is that yeah, what don't yeah. run away. Yeah. I remember it. I, I didn't know the specifics of it, but God, it's tough to believe that he was able to sell that as the anthem of the Francis Scott Key, huh? Right. You Why talk is about it's a America who's... the Beautiful or God Bless America? Or, yeah. you know, it should be America the Beautiful. What a great song! Yeah, it's a great song. No, I, I didn't see the Fergie thing. I didn't see it. That is to say, I didn't see her sing it. But I saw the blowback on social media. So yeah. I'll just share my first knee-jerk thought was. What a load of shit this is. I, and here is what I mean by that. Standing for the anthem, not standing for the anthem, knowing the words to the anthem, not knowing the words, singing them, not singing them, hand on heart, not hand on heart, doesn't have his hat off, does have his hat off, wearing a pin on his lapel, doesn't have an American flag on his lapel, made a speech without any American flags in the audience. It's all paper patriotism. It is nothing. Totally. It, that should, what you just said should be replayed over and over again. I don't care about the anthem. I care about the country and what this country right. is about. Right. Why the hell do we sing it before a sporting event? It's I don't played, get it. Well, that's another. It's played way too oh much. Oh, my God. Every time you have a sporting event, you have to sing the national anthem? Come on. And now people have bought, song. have bought this crap so much that you know, you'll sometimes you'll be at a party where there's like the Super Bowl or some yeah. big event. And when the anthem plays, people will, some people will stop and like, hey. Yeah. I get it. Right. I mean, it, you speak with your action. You don't speak in this moment by whether or not you stop and, right. and put your hand over your heart. Yeah, and sing it before the World Series, game one. Sing it opening day. Sing it the Stanley Cup final, whatever. Sing it once in a while if you want. It feels to me like the gasps of an insecure nation. Totally, totally, totally. And uh, as we have a president who seems like he's an insecure president gasping right now, maybe it's the right song to sing. Well, I hope I haven't bummed everybody out. I'm, I love this country, everybody. That's what I'm trying to say. You may be hearing from the greatest patriot right now. But if there is one person whose patriotism rivals my own, it is the man without whom we could not do the Fast 15. I'm talking about Microsoft. Oh. 
Thank you all. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Hey, Dana. Dana, meet, meet me back there. I'd love to catch up with you. Dana! Thanks so much. If you enjoy listening to The Edge, support them by subscribing to The Edge on iTunes, Stitcher, and you can listen through the iHeartRadio app. Get busy listening. Subscribe to The Edge on iTunes or on Stitcher. Writer, comedian John Ross will join us. He's written on a bunch of different shows. John left Hollywood. The call to go to New England with his family and raise his child with his wife there in New England was too strong for him to resist. We'll ask him about why he left and his job in New England, at least one of them, was for the post office. He was a postal delivery guy in rural New England. How can that not be a great job? Apparently, it wasn't, and he'll tell us about it. John Ross, you left the Hollywood life to take your family into New England in a place that, I don't know, had you had any experience in New England prior to that? Why did you go to New England? Well, I had the great fortune and uh, also my chagrin, I married a woman. And so (laughs) (laughs) And so it was her decision, is that what you're telling me? Yeah, more or less. I mean, we both are originally from New Jersey, but met in L.A. But when I met her, she'd gone to the University of Massachusetts and fell in love with this area, which is called the Pioneer Valley. And when I met her in L.A., she was getting ready to move back to this area. She had her bags packed almost, and she was getting rid of her apartment, and she was going to move. And she met me and fell in love, and we got married, and she pretty much resented me for the next uh, 11 years uh, for (laughs) keeping her in Los Angeles. She truly did not like it very much. And, you know, she was trying to make the best of it. And then when our kid was born, she was pretty clear, like, we're not going to raise our kid in L.A., are we? And and I was like, oh, yeah, no, I don't, because I never really wanted to stay. I never loved, loved Los Angeles. You know, you and I met where we both lived in the Bay Area in San Francisco, a place that I really love, where, where they inculcate you with this hatred of Los Angeles. Remember <laughs> that, that whole... Yeah, when you move here and you, you have to tell people I'm moving to L.A., it's just as though you're saying, uh, I'm going to go become a Scientologist and I can't speak to any of you anymore, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely a, a suppressive person aspect. <laughs> yeah. And the thing I used to say about Los Angeles was, look, when I was trying to explain myself, to to those people. (laughs) But also, to some extent, I I felt this way. This is where my business is. If I built cars, I would live in Detroit back when actually Detroit made cars. But, you know, I'm here because this is where the the showbiz factory is. And I I never wanted to retire in Los Angeles. I always thought I would go back to the Bay Area. And that was, of course, before the Bay Area became completely bought by, you know, the tech and you can't afford to live anywhere near there. So, yeah, I'm wondering, uh, by the way, I'm wondering what those people are saying now, because the charm and the kind of uh, we would never sell out the way people do in, in L.A. to a sort of a one dimensional dollar driven society uh, that can't be the. Uh, they can't fly that flag anymore in the city of San Francisco. Well, except that they hate it. Uh, the people who are saying all that stuff, they hate that whole thing. like it's not people didn't turn into that they got taken over by that's that. true okay that's fair you yeah. know so when my wife started saying you know we're not going to raise our kid in la i was kind of like okay okay but you know the first couple of years don't matter like it's not, it's not going to remember preschool it's not going to remember first grade and so and i was trying to get to i wanted to get to the lifetime health benefit with the Writers Guild, which, you know, you need to work for a certain number of, you know, be vested for a certain number of years. And I would have already made it, but they had a rule where if there was a break in service for a couple of years, you lost the earlier years. So I had not worked for a couple of years early on and lost like two years from my, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And then, and, and then, one year, I was literally like $1,100 short of making the minimum, oh. so that didn't count. And then another year, I worked for um, an animated show on HBO, The Life and Times of Tim, and that wasn't Writers Guild covered because oh of the animation, God. you know, that loophole. Oh. So, so I was still a couple of years short, and I was like telling my wife, look, let me just make these last couple of years, and we'll get out of here. And And so... We started looking up north, and we started going further and further north. You know, we, we looked up at Sebastopol. That was really nice, and but that was expensive. And I wanted some land, so we we got all the way up to uh, Oregon, 
looking in the uh, on the other side of the Cascades, that what they call the high desert bend. You ever yeah, that way? no, because it's dry. Is that the point? Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's sunny. It's not like the other side is that cloudy Portland right. kind of overcast, rainy all the time. But it's sunny. It's like L.A. except you know it's snow in the winter. And so we were looking at that, and we got to there, and my wife was like. Well, if we get here, I don't know anybody here. You don't know anybody here. We're completely started. And me, you know, I'm a guy, so I'm like, well, I know you. <laughs> like, isn't, that, isn't that enough? <laughs> like, she wanted something more. A community, a though. community, which she had. A connection you know, to the, already, yeah. Yeah. And so, but in the meantime, you know, we're still struggling to try to get the last couple of years of work and it wasn't working out. And then I sold that Nickelodeon kids show and it didn't get me. I'm still, I'm one year short. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. So, so if anybody can get me some work, I would love to. <laughs> well, here's the problem. And, and of course, the problem is when you move from LA, it's tougher to take meetings and you, you know, obviously you can still be as productive. You can still write from wherever you are. Well, and also, I'd be happy, and my wife would certainly be happy if I, you know, took six months in L.A. and we went my, back. My wife would certainly be happy. She'd like to get you out of the house for six months. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> look, L.A. as a writer is hard enough if you're there banging on the door all the time and you're, you know, 30 years old. When you start getting... 40 and then 50 and then you move 3,000 miles away it's virtually impossible yeah you need but, people who have faith in you who go hey this guy i know he's far away but he'd be perfect for us you know right so anyway you so, so you move I, there i sold the show and she said that's it we're taking that money and we are going to massachusetts and i was like cool it's a beautiful area it's it's really great i like the seasons I prefer having a winter and a fall and a spring. And, and even within those seasons, there's sort of micro seasons, and you get to know those. But what part of Massachusetts did you decide on? It's called the Pioneer Valley, and it is where the five colleges are, UMass, Amherst, Smith, Holyoke, Hampshire College, I think is the other one. And so it's the little town I'm in is called Deerfield, and Northampton is the town just south of us, and the town north of us that's nice is Brattleboro. That's in Vermont. So, so how, how would you describe the community that you live in? Uh, it's a small town. It's pretty rural, but there's some awesome restaurants, farm to table, some great bars. The beer around here is phenomenal. <laughs> a lot of you know local microbreweries and stuff, and yeah, really great food. And um, but it's a pretty rural. I have technically eleven acres. Wow. Uh, so wait a minute. What's on your eleven acres? Are you like? Are you a farmer now? No, I am not a farmer. A lot of it is is in conservation, meaning it's you can't build on it, you can't do anything to it. It's a lot of it's just kind of woods. It some of it is a hillside, and that is almost a monocrop of maple trees. And those that whole hillside, it's not all mine, but uh, there's a local farmer who taps those trees, and we get paid in maple syrup. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so, yeah, we get— That makes you know, up for not making the health benefits. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's—and uh, then there's, like, almost, you know, a, a little pond that's technically mine. But, but I, I do have a garden that's bigger than most people's whole yard. It's, you know, it's probably a couple thousand square feet, you know. So when you move there to this place that's mostly rural— didn't you become a postman? <laughs> well, briefly, that is someday I am going to do a one-man show called Going Postal. And, oh, I um, love that. You did become a postman when you moved back I, to Massachusetts. I, brief, I briefly became a postman. That might have been charming and fun, was it not? That's the look, a couple of, there are a few things that people have misconceptions about that they think are far, are going to be charming and fun if they want to do. <laughs> One is driving cross country in an RV, you know, with your family and animals. Uh, I quickly disabused us of that because when we moved out here, we tried to do that. And I, ended up, I bought this old RV and we drove a, a, across the country. It, halfway through, we scuttled the thing. <laughs> you're, you're kidding. And, no, it I does, swear to God, it does just, sound great. Wait a minute. What happened with that? Look, um, it, it was an old <laughs> RV, and even though I had put a bunch of money in, into it, it immediately started breaking down. And on the first <laughs> night, we're on, we're on, what is it, is it the 15 on a Friday night leaving L.A.? Oh, my God. Well, that's just the, a bad before, strategy to leave. <laughs> right. Well, because we had to go. We were going to a closing. We were, you know, we oh, had bought the house. 
And now we got to get there. And I had a show that night. You know, we were shooting the show. And I left after the taping, and we got in this RV and started driving, and it broke down on the 15. Now imagine, you know what that's like? Everybody's headed to Vegas for the weekend. Yeah. It's a two-lane highway. I'm stuck in this giant RV blocking one of the lanes. Oh. It's, probably by, it's probably backed up, you know, 20 miles behind me. Oh, my God. Everybody passing me is giving me the stink eye. Like, who is this asshole and this old busted out? So anyway, then the heat didn't work, and then it broke in the middle of the night, and we were, like, left for dead in Oklahoma somewhere, and you can't get anybody to tow you because you need a giant wrecker. And we had to, like, uh, (laughs) bribe a motel to let us in the middle of the night with a dog. And I I ended up buying a truck um, from a dealership, on, it was basically uh, Christmas Eve almost, and then driving through a blizzard to get here oh on time. Oh, my God. That's, a, that's unbelievable. So your yeah. problem, though, to be fair, the yeah. strategy of driving cross-country in an RV with the family wasn't necessarily the problem. The problem was the RV that you chose was a that's bad one. That's part of it. But that's part of it. But a lot of things about the RV you don't really think that much about. Like, you know what? I've come across a few sort of truisms from that experience. And one is, if you take a poop, you want to drive away from it and not bring it with you. (laughs) You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like the idea that you you poop in this thing, and now you've got it in this tank, and you've got to, when you get somewhere, like attach a hose and empty it, and there's got chemicals you got to put in to keep it, and then chemicals you got to put in to keep the water from free. It's like driving an apartment around. You don't want to do it. It's not <laughs> like they have motels for like 60 bucks. You know what I mean? Like it's just not a great idea. Okay, now and wait then, a minute. Now, so, I'm, so would, uh, or, and to everyone listening, I mean, uh, is mm-hmm. the plan a better plan, the one that's associated with, okay, we're going to pile everybody in the car, but we're going to stay at motels along the way? If you, But is that A, does that pencil out so it, it's doable? And B, does that work? Or now the close quarters might be an issue because you're now in a car with uh, you know, your wife and one child maybe or you know, a dog or cat or – You know? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think maybe it's fly everybody. I didn't want to fly the animals because, you know, in the dead of winter, they can't promise you that because those holding areas below aren't heated, I don't think. No. And and if they get stuck on a tarmac for a certain number of hours, they can die easily. They can, and they they make no guarantees. And one of our dogs was a puppy, and I was like, I I can't, I can't do it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to live with yourself if you made that mistake, I think. I, that's what I thought then. Now I'm thinking different. Like, you know what? They have dogs in Massachusetts. Um, they get a new one. Um, no, I don't know. I don't know the answer really, but, um, but that, okay. So, so you, so you, you start on this star cross journey. It goes sideways. You finally make it to Massachusetts and you become a postman in a charming, marvelous journey. So that's the other, you know, I was hanging around the house a lot. And she was kind of saying, you know, maybe you should get some kind of job just to get out of the house, just to do something. And where we live, um, we live in a town called Deerfield. And right down the hill from us is Old Deerfield, which possibly you've heard of. It's where Deerfield Academy is, which maybe you've also heard of. It's a very famous, like the Kennedys all send their kids there. Uh And uh, yeah, it's like there's princes, the sons of of foreign kings. And Why couldn't you get a job at Deerfield Academy, John? Well, as what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not qualified to do anything. So anyway, but it's, it's a historic village, which actually people live in it. And our post office is from like 1696. It's like the most adorable, cute little building, you know, with the... And so we walk in there to get our mail. So we have a post office box and there's a sign that's like, hey, looking for, you know, mail help and everything. And I went, oh, my God. Like, it was like part time. And I thought, wow, to come in here and, you know, hey, Mr. Johnson, here's your stamps. Like, I don't know. It just sounded cool. And I thought, hey, maybe I'll, like, uh, apply for that. And so it turns out it's for a rural carrier. It wasn't to work in the post office. Those jobs are much more coveted. It was for a rural carrier, which is the guy who drives the truck and puts mail in the mailboxes by the road. Sure, sure. Right? So – not a lot of interaction with the public, unfortunately. Well, I mean, if you want to get to meet your community. Right. But, 
you are delivering packages. A lot of times you need signatures for those. And so, oh, yeah. m- because more and more, that's what's keeping the post office in business is Amazon. That's and true. so, so the romantic notion I have is like, oh, I'll drive. It's a beautiful country where I live. And I said, I'll be driving around the country and I'll be, you know, I have my headphones on. And I'll be listening to a podcast and I'll be thinking of ideas for stories I want to write. And I'll be giving, here's your mail, you know, and I thought, oh, that'll be. Charming. Yes, I agree with that. I like that. I would have endorsed oh. that. Oh, my God. You can't imagine how wrong you are. I mean, I will cut to the end of the story and tell you that in order to get out, I basically drove the truck into a tree. <laughs> <laughs> to release myself from this nightmare. Oh, my God. Um, you, wh- why, yeah. why, is it not the, why is it not the dreamy scene that I think it is? Well... I mean, I will tell you some of the story. So first, it says, hey, if you're interested, go to, and you log on, and it takes you some post office site, and it says, take this test. You know, to, and so the test is literally, literally questions like, if you have a disagreement with one of your coworkers, do you, A, discuss it amicably and come to some kind of reasonable solution, B, go to your car and get an automatic weapon, <laughs> or C, you know, it's like really obvious what the answers are supposed to be, and you and it, they're just trying to weed out like the psychopaths, and so, you know, I answer that thing, I go, hey, I'm going to ace this thing, and that's really just this hurdle to get through to the next level, which is, oh, all right, if you're interested, you sign up, and then you take you have to go take this test. And here's a sample of this test. And it is so hard. It's like a memory thing where they give you a bunch of addresses. There's different parts of the test. Some are harder than others. But this one part where you have to basically memorize these addresses, you get to look at them for a couple of minutes, and then it goes away. And then they show you the address. Does that go to A or B or C or D? And you're like, I, I, I got like a 25 out of 100 on the first time I took this practice test. Wow. Now I'm mad. Right. Because... You and I have been to the post office. You've seen the, the knuckle-dragging mouth breathers who work there. You're like, so all those people pass that test, and I can't pass that test? Is that what you're saying? I can't. So I, like, started, um, like, looking for hints, clues on the Internet. Like, how do you pass this test? And I started studying, and I started um, doing these mnemonic tricks where you take the address, the name of the street, and then you come up with an image and you, and basically we have to do these mnemonic devices where you change every number into like an image, like one is gun and, you know, two is shoe. So if it's, if the number is 12, it's one, two, it's like gun shoe. And so you imagine a gun and a shoe. So, you know, it's like, that's how you have to be able to remember oh my stuff. God. Yeah. Yeah. This is like, way more intense than I would have even ever conceived. Right. And so it's like, um, uh, so if it's like uh, 12 Christian Lane, so Christian, you imagine like Jesus with a gun in his shoe. And so it's like, now I can remember, you know, uh, right. So, so like I'm playing these tricks and now, and my wife's like, look, it was just an idea. Like, oh, don't do it. And I'm like, fuck that. I, I'm going to pass this test. I don't even want to work for the post office, but I got to pass this test because I won't be able to face myself going into a post office anymore, looking at a postman and saying that they could pass that thing. And I couldn't. And so I go in and I pass the test and I'm like, oh, thank God. Like I got an 83 or whatever I needed to just wow. get over the hump. And so then weeks go by and I don't hear anything. And I'm like glad because I don't want to do it. And then I get a call or an email that says, hey, congratulations, like you're one of some people that can go interview. And I go and I take like, a, it's like a group interview where I go and then they tell you that it's like a, based on a certain number of points. And if you're a veteran, you get extra points. And I, I go, I'm not going to get this. Another couple of weeks go by, they go, congratulations, you've been offered a part-time, you know, rural associate carrier job. And so now I got to go to a training thing down like and we're at the train to drive one of those boxes you know those square sure. Sure. postal trucks yeah, they're that's part nuts of, okay but there that's part of the charm now you're back to the charming part don't you want to drive one of those cool i think with the they've got doors on both sides that open or you drive on the wrong side isn't the 
it's you know what I'm talking got about. The one, it's only got the, the door on the, on the one side. And let me tell you, these things are hard to drive, and you are having to negotiate a lot of stuff. And you have to, there's a lot of different mirrors, and you've got to not hit things and not hit people. <laughs> and, and, you, and you've got to, every time, buckle your seatbelt, <laughs> do the emergency brake, do it in this order. And it's, like, unbelievably, like, complicated and difficult. But so anyway, so I do that. Do you hear, does so, everybody, I just want to, do you hear the resentment as John looks back on this? experience it's just terrific okay so you get the training on how to drive the box yeah and so now i have to go train so basically post people work like rural carriers work six days a week and they have one day off and that's the day they're fill in that would be my job to come in on that one day right Mm -hmm. and so i got to go train on this guy's route this guy has it's the longest it's one of the longest routes like anywhere it's 55 miles this, wow. this route. And the first thing you do when you come in in the morning is you got to sort the mail. You have this big, these big things of mail and you have to put it in these slots. Okay. That, that are arranged. It's like basically a U in front of you with slots and all these different levels, but it's set up in the way you drive the route. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you might go up one street like, let's say you're going up Christian Street, right? Mm-hmm. And now it's, you know, one through 100 Christian Street. But now you're going to turn right on this, on, you know, um, State Street, right? Mm-hmm. And now you're going to go that street to another street, but you're going to come back to on the other side of the street. So this thing is laid out like that. So when you pick up a letter and it says something, something Christian Street, depending on the number, it might go on a slot low and to your left. But if it's a high number, it might go up and to the right. You understand what I'm saying? Like in order for this thing to be laid out, and this is an enormous amount of mail. And the guy who's been doing it for 25 years could pick it up and like not even be looking at them and be talking and just to go through, 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 and putting them in, in the slots, right? I would have to look at it and go, uh, 12 uh, Christian Lane. Okay, that's to the right. No, wait. No, no. It's, no, it's in the center. No, wait. It's, it's down low. In the, no, it's up to the uh, one, two, ah, there it is. And I put it in. That's one letter. Okay. <laughs> wow. And there's, and there's a pile of letters behind you, like stacked so high. And I would get there as, as soon as they would open at six in the morning. So I, I tried to train with this guy. Then you got to go out and learn this route where you got to drive it. And this guy was way overweight and he didn't like training somebody and he didn't want me in his truck. And so like, I did it like once he's like, yeah, you got it. You got it. Like he didn't want me to keep wow. doing it. And I was like, Oh, okay. And plus he's such a, a douche. He takes his week of work, uh, his, his vacation week. Cause that, the real thing is I'm training to come in for a full week and do this. I see. Okay. He takes it on the most horrendous week of the year where not only is the weather terrible, but it's when all of the packages, the Christmas packages, it's like the week (laughs) after Thanksgiving or something or before Thanksgiving. I can't remember which one where not only are there a ton of letters, but there's a trillion catalogs and you've got to put away all these, you got to, it's called sorting or I can't remember what it's called. You know, you got to put away these catalogs. Then you've got, all these boxes. So anyway, I would sit there and sort as fast as I could. And it would be like four hours to get it all sorted. All right. And I go, thank God I got it. They go, oh, you still got your packages. (gasps) For every package, you've got to then find out which address this package and put in a special slip. So, you know, when you get to that house, there's a slip in there. It goes, oh, I got to go find the package. And then you got all these packages in the back of the uh, thing now. And you've got to like, if you don't arrange them in the right way, you've got to look through every single package to figure out which one goes to which house. Oh my and it's always the God. last one. Right. And so, and the idea that you would listen to music or that you would do anything other than be, it, it is the worst combination of intensely boring and super stressful. <laughs> it is, it is, it is the worst <laughs> job, the, the anxiety. And the first time you do it, so not only are you putting, you know, delivering mail, if somebody's got the flag up on their mailbox, right? Oh, yeah, that's you, right. Yeah. You've got to take their mail. Okay, you, you've now made a promise that this is going to go out in today's mail. So that means you've got to finish and be back at the post office by 5 o'clock. Oh, wow. Okay? So they told me the first day, like, yeah, you're not going to make it. Like, like there's no – like, so what you've got to do 
You've got to abandon wherever you are. You've got to stop delivering mail and get back here to be here at five because you just have to. So I did my best. I got as far as I could. And then it was like, all right, now I got to race back to be there by five to give my, and so then I ended end up going back and finishing in the dark. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, I was fairly lucky when those first ones where I was just learning it, that the weather was okay, but this is November in freaking Massachusetts. It could have been two feet of snow and I'm at some like dirt roads and, you know, farms and like, it's crazy. It was the worst. And then you get, oh, and I'm telling you, when you'd be stacking, you'd be sorting your mail and you'd just be towards getting to the end, they would just drop another thing of of, uh, catalogs. And you'd like, it would never stop. It it was like, it it was bottomless. It does feel like a circle of hell. It really does. Oh, it is exactly what it is. And I'm telling you, and they tell you, you know, they drill in you, be careful, be careful. But you, tr- you have to rush because in order to – plus, after – in the beginning when you're training, I think you're getting paid by the hour. But after a certain point, you go to this system where um, they've decided how long it should take to do it. And that's oh, what you get paid. Wow. So anything longer than that, you know – You're, you're on your own time. Le- yeah. yeah. And I'm not getting any benefits. I'm, and honestly, I – don't want to do this at this point. And I'm like, I, I how, how long into the like, job are you when you go, look, this is not for me. Oh, uh, a month or two, you know? So now you've and, made it through the, so now you've really made it through a couple of months of the intense winter of new England and you're doing this, you're well, running no, this route. I, I, I'm right in the teeth of the winter now when there's snow on the ground and I'm on this dirt road driveway that's on a hill and it goes like around a corner and I put mail in and I look and I'm driving off and I'm looking down to uh, like get the next house's mail to make sure I've got that in my hand. And I look down for a second and two of my wheels kind of go off this little road and into like a thing and I can't pull it back in time and bang into a tree (laughs) and I wreck the, and I have to call the post office and they have to send out somebody you know, uh, uh, an emergency mailman to take the rest of my mail. Oh, sure. Of course. Yeah, that's right. It's like, you know, you got to go home. And I'm like, goodbye. The, Audio. <laughs> this, but, but that wasn't then, it wasn't a deliberate act that just happened. And you, you took that opportunity to say, Hey, you know what? This isn't for me. It was, it was not uh, conscious, but I will, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to believe my subconscious was we must stop doing this. There, <laughs> There is a tree located conveniently right in front of you. Um, <laughs> oh, so. my God. That's a great story, though. I love it. You absolutely have to bring it to life in some form because it really is. It feels like, uh, you know, those uh, I guess it's been, you know, what was it? Ray Romano ran for mayor in some small town. That was one movie. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Mooseville uh, or whatever the Moose, hell it was called. Yeah. Um, and um, But I feel like these. Fish out of water, but I'm going to try to make it work. Kind of situations can really be funny stuff if you get you, you could write it really funny. But you know, anyway, it's really yeah. Maybe maybe I should. Uh, it could be an element. In, yeah, an element in my exactly. Movie. Right. And I did. Uh, I did get to do some writing work. I got to go to Germany to help write a show, write a pilot for the German television. Um, they're trying to get into comedy. And, um, wow, that's but, wild. Yeah. How did they even find out about you? Who recommended um, you? Well, I, there's a, a producer. It was a kind of a whole circuitous thing, but this producer that who is German, who was over here doing something, she and I met through someone else and she had read something that I had written and she was like, really like me and wanted to try to figure out, you know, how we could work together. And, you know, the German film industry goes way, way back, you know, to the beginning. Sure. You know, Bertolt Brecht and, you know, the, they have a very vibrant film industry and a very vibrant television industry. It, it's just all dramas. It's medical dramas, legal dramas, police dramas, uh, you know, law. It's all dramas. Right. Yeah. And but now in this age of it's a global village and kids grow up watching everything, they have a taste now for comedy and they have a channel where they pretty much run 24 hours a day, How I Met Your Mother and Big Bang Theory and, you know, Two and a Half Men. And they have to import all these shows. And at a certain point, the 
German industry was saying, we should start making our own comedies. They certainly have a taste for it now. Like the, like I said, the kids growing up, they all see uh, How I Met Your Mother. They love that show. They <laughs> love all these comedies. And my friend, Christine, this producer, realized that the way to do it is what you need is to really import a, a whole like an American team to basically mentor a new generation of young German writers sure. and like bring a writer's room over. And she's been trying to do that for a long time. And she, you know, eventually they let her bring like one writer. Like she wanted to bring like a whole crew. Um, but they had this one idea that they liked that two young German writers pitched and that they liked and they they sort of bought this idea and so they brought me over there and I work with them and we developed the idea what was the idea what's the pitch what's the log line for it or well and it's very funny because they are very german they like engineering and so they do want that big hook they want it to be engineered <laughs> and so it was a show where a girl has had this terrible year. Her business that she opened fails. Her boyfriend has been a real shit and he's cheated on her. And it's her 30th birthday. And they throw her this party on this very famous elevated train. Like they rent it, which you can do. And to throw her this party. And she meets this other guy. And he says like, let's leave this podunk town and get out of here. And She's just finding out that her business is failing. And at this party, she falls out of this elevated train, bangs her head, and forgets this whole terrible year and thinks that tomorrow is the grand opening of her business and that her boyfriend, she's like madly in love with this guy because she's only just, you know, fallen in love with him. And she's completely forgotten the new guy. <laughs> okay, right? that's good. Yeah. So she's got this kind of weird amnesia. Has, or she's like, just forgotten the last year as opposed to exactly, anything else. Exactly, yeah. yes. Which is, a, which is a, you know, a high-concept TV thing, but I, I'll buy it, okay? Sure. And so this guy decides to stay, the new guy decides to stay, hoping that she's going to remember that her boyfriend, who's very contrite, and now he's got a brand new second chance. Right. You know, he doesn't want her to remember any of the bad things, and everybody's kind of trying to control her memories of the last year and stuff. And so it was cute. It was not a terrible idea. But I will say that the notes we were getting from the network were very much like, just too many jokes. <laughs> you know, like I, when we wrote the first draft, I was like feeling like, God, it's just not funny enough. It just needs, you know, and I was just trying to put push more jokes into it at every point that I could. And they were it's like, it's like so, so many jokes with the repartee. And like, yeah, haven't you seen any of these? No, not really. I'm in the drama department. So why are you giving us notes? And so it ended up, it didn't get bought. They decided to make it. But while I was there, I had an idea. I said, this isn't the show you should be making. Because this you could do anywhere. This could be in Seattle. She could fall out of the monorail. But you should be doing the German show. And I came up with this idea of a, an American guy who goes over there, he falls in love with a German girl. And so now he's got this like crazy culture shock because it is different in Germany. And so this guy is now, he's not only falling in love and having to negotiate a new relationship, he's having to negotiate a whole new culture. So anyway, I may still be trying to pitch that show. The, it's called Jack and Hilda. I love uh, that fish out of water thing. I just think it's funny. And, you know, so yeah. now the American in Germany trying to adjust. I think that that's funny. I mean, potentially, you know. Um... Yeah. And so then he, he ends up running a bar where they do an open mic and there's all these and all the people who, you know, the waitress is a comedian and a musician but she's from you know algeria and because they're having and so it's a lot about people from other places fitting into german culture and everybody's sharing their wow isn't germany weird and what and the germans love that humor because it, when i did the stand-up every single comedian it's all they talk about and all the germans wanted to laugh about is how different they are from everybody else and yeah make fun of us for that you know, yeah. yeah, we all love to work and we always want to be on time. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you were you worked with Louis C.K., right? You actually did his first HBO show, which I thought was funny. Yeah. Um, it was called it was what was that? Life with Lucky, Louis or something like that? Lucky Louis. Lucky Louis. Yeah. I, th I actually yeah. thought that was funny. It definitely had a lot of funny stuff. 
Yeah. Flawed, but it was funny. Of course, his FX show is uh, is legend now. I mean, now it's yeah. uh, become, it sort of straddles the world of comedy and serious. And, and then he gets caught up in the jaws of Me Too. I don't know what his future will be. I feel as though he will come back at some point. Yeah, he's got the benefit of being able to run his own deal. Like, he doesn't need anybody because he can... You know, he's got his fans and his followers through his website. And if he did a special and put it up, he would, I think he could make a million dollars just selling it for five bucks a pop, you know, through his own, you know what I mean? He doesn't need Netflix or anybody. I don't I think. It. Yeah. Uh, it, I, maybe. But, uh, I'm but, not so, sure. But. And it's, it's interesting. I would think a performer and a guy like him that does so much stuff that is really, um, right on the edge, maybe over the edge, maybe inappropriate, whatever, depending on what you like. Uh, I would think he would even feel the need to do something. You know what I mean? Like, he's one of those guys who... I don't know if you saw Chris Rock just did a Netflix special. I, I, I just watched it. Yeah, and, and I thought it was really interesting. He talks about having been addicted to porn. He talks yeah. about his divorce and playing around yeah. on his wife. There's a real sense of honesty and unburdening and then finding the funny in all of it. You know, mm -hmm. and I feel mm -hmm. as though Louis C.K. is in that same category. I mean, you're a real kind of analytic comedian and writer, and so I was. I, I'm just curious what your take is on all of that. Yeah, I, I yeah, I think exactly so. He's going to take some cooling off time. He's going to let the, the dust settle, or uh, you know, it to blow over. No pun intended there. Mm -hmm. um, and just when the time is right, I'm sure his brain is still coming up with funny stuff. I mean, he can't help it. He's talking about this to himself. You know, that's how you write material. You talk to yourself. And he's explaining to an imaginary person, an imaginary audience, what's going on. And he's coming up with stuff. And eventually, it, he's going to want to do it for people, I think. That makes sense. Have you been to the movies? Have you seen any of the stuff that's, that's out there? Anything that you particularly like? You know, not as much as... As you did when you, you were know, in I L.A. Used, yeah. Well, you know what? I'm a uh, Writers Guild emeritus, so I stopped getting the discs. Oh, stopped sure, yeah. Getting... The screeners are I, really good. Yeah, the screen. Current. I don't get the screeners, so I haven't been going to the movies too much. I did just see Black Panther. Oh, cool. Um, uh, I, it's funny. I also just saw Black Panther and a lot of Black Panther in the show, but it's kind of current. I, I just really wanted to see it because I'd heard so many great things about it. I'd also seen how much money it had made at the box office. They're clearly selling out theaters. I don't think you do that unless people are really happy and they either want to go back or they want to tell all their friends about it and all that. Anyway, that's all bad because when I get into the theater, I may be expecting a different movie or a better movie or something. My expectations were clearly affected by all of that stuff going on, all the positive Black Panther noise ra uh, raised my expectations and ultimately I go, okay, uh, it's good uh, and it's tight and I like the story and all that, but I wasn't, you know, blown away by it. Now, I'm not a superhero movie guy though, but I, I, I liked Wonder Woman, you know, that was a superhero movie. I would say it was about as good as Wonder Woman was, which is really good, you know, but it wasn't like, oh my God, this is unreal Black Panther. Did you walk away feeling, you know, almost exuberant about how good it was? All right. Well, obviously, you are a racist. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, you hit the nail exactly on the head is exactly my feelings, which is it is really, really, really good. Maybe it's even really, really great, dot, 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 for a superhero movie. I have limited interest in superhero movies. I felt the exact same thing about Wonder Woman. I, you know, it's a lot of fighting, you know. I mean, look, when I was 14, I loved that shit. But, you know, Wonder Woman, Black Panther, uh, Iron Man, I, I, all of them, I have limited interest. It's, it's a lot of fighting and, you know, chasing and explosions. I just watched, you know, my wife and kid were out of town. And so I watched, um, I was going through Netflix and I saw, I'm looking for things that my wife doesn't want to watch. And so it was <laughs> Rogue One, the Star Wars movie. And I watched the Star Wars movie. And again, that was also good. But you know what it's a lot of? It's a lot of pew, 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 pew. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, things exploding and blowing up and People are, are very strong, and they can't really be hurt no matter what you do to them. And so ultimately, I'm just not that fucking interested. Yeah, that's what – you just hit on something that makes, in particular, the superhero movies a chore for me, and here's what it is. I can't keep track of who's ahead in a fight since nothing seems to 
give you the edge in a fight. Here, I'll go back to the end of Wonder Woman, uh, during which they are throwing buildings at each other. Okay, it, it knocks the guy down for a minute, and you think, oh, wow, now he's in trouble. I think Wonder Woman's finally won this battle. And then he, like, shakes his head, and now he's back up at full strength, and now he throws a building at her, you know? And that's what happened in Black Panther. I just couldn't keep track of some reasonable grade of weaponry that was actually going to be effective in winning the battle. You know what it's like? It's like our politics. Nothing matters. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, he, he said he grabs a woman by the pussy. Oh, that's like being hit by a building, right? No, he just shakes it and just like keeps going. You know what I mean? Oh, he colluded with the Russians. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Yeah. Oh, you know? hooker payoff. He's done now. Nope. Yeah, he's done. Yeah. No, 103 cents. Oh, a hooker and a porn star yeah. at, the, you know, at the same time <laughs> while his wife was uh, breastfeeding their baby. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it is, it's like, it is. It's, he's like a superhero. It's like none of it freaking matters. So who cares? Yeah. So, uh, well, I think th- it's nice because I think you end up right where I was. And since I'm always looking for someone to agree with me, thank you. Well, and I'll tell you. So what, what happens kind of with these movies is. I really only start to like them for how funny they are and how much comedy they put in them. Like, did you see, what's the one? Defenders of the Galaxy, is that what it is? Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. That was really entertaining. It was really funny. There was a lot of funny stuff. Right. And one that we saw, I don't know, we must have been on the road and we needed something to do. We saw that um, Ragnarok that one, I didn't four. see that. Yeah, you know, I would never have seen that, but it, there was some reason we were needed a family movie, and we went and saw it. And there is some really funny stuff in it, and I enjoyed it for that purpose. But yeah, there's a fight between Thor and the Hulk, where it's that same thing. Where so nothing kills either of them. So what is it that makes a fight? Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know how you score it on points. So <laughs> right, <exactly>. anyway. <laughs> Yeah. So I had a a short film in mind once years ago, and it was really based on my experience playing poker. I would play in these uh, yeah. rooms filled with cigar smoke, and it was kind of. And I thought I'd like to open on a shot. Clearly, it's somebody's basement. Maybe we come in through the window, one of those storm windows, and we see smoke rising out, and we hear a lot of poker chatter. You know what I mean? Like uh, just yeah. a lot of man poker chatter, and. Uh, some of it's like off color dirty, but it's sort of all in that world. And then we come down and it's all of these superheroes. Just imagine all the Marvel superheroes sitting sure. at the table playing cards in their full suits, right? Sure, sure. And sure. but there's two minutes of them just exchanging bullshit poker stuff and then one of them will launch into some story about how they saved the world. You know, yeah, well, let me tell you what was really tough. When we had, I was being held in a gulag in Russia made out of kryptonite, okay? So I didn't have a fucking chance in this dump. <laughs> and he begins to tell a story like that. And they're kind of telling dueling. Eh. See, I thought you were going for like, like Superman is like looking through the cards. So they need like lead lead <laughs> cards. And then like Doctor Strange can kind of like read your mind and oh, see what you've got good. in your hand. And it's like, yeah, I right, fuck it. So we can't. It's like that old joke. You come out here to golf or right, fuck around. Right. I can see you guys. Yeah. We try to do this every so often. I can yeah, see we yeah, just can't yeah. do it, can we, you guys? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, fun. That's actually a funnier finish. Right. Um, well, Johnny, great talking to you. I feel we didn't uh, cover a lot, but I loved what we covered. Um, I'm thrilled talking to you anytime. Uh, next time we speak, you must tell everybody about that show you did and the concept of going through the dumpster, the dumpster diving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, sure. a, it was a, what was it called again? It was a dumpster? Yeah, dumpster divers. I don't know if we had a name. It was, we were pitching it yeah. as a reality show. And then, of course, they want to make it into a game and they want it or make it into like when you, you pitch it to these reality show places, they're like, so are they assholes and do they fight? And do they start calling <laughs> each other names? And they're like, no, they just, you know, I'm sorry. <clears throat> but kind of it's like an underground society where they live on dumpsters, yeah. dumpster stuff. And then, yeah, this, that exists in yeah. LA. Yeah. All right, John Ross, if you want to reach, John Ross. I just started going on Twitter, and my Twitter handle, is that what you call it? Is yep. at Fun with Friction. At Fun with Friction. Yeah, and I tweet out some funny stuff. Well, you're a funny guy, man. I'm not surprised. I always felt like you're the you're the twenty game winner, but you gotta give him a chance to get on the mound once in a while, you know. So thanks, John. Appreciate it. Talk to you next time. We will talk about other things in future when John returns. I think we've learned not to raise your expectations on movies, and also to appreciate the job that your postal worker is doing. Until next time, bye-bye. Oh, okay, let me, okay, yeah, let me just, yeah.
It's just something. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to thank you for all the ways that you support my friends on the Edge podcast. And if you haven't already, why don't you show your support and subscribe? What's the matter with you? Go to Edge Show. Oh, shit, it's Edge Dash. What, what's with the dash? Stupid. All right, let me. I want to thank you for all the ways that you support my friends on the Edge podcast. To show your support and leave something on their website, edge show Dot com. Stupid. Why is that dash? Edge-show.com. Edge-show.com. If you like The Edge, help us out by liking us on Facebook. Subscribe to The Edge with Mark Thompson on iTunes or on Stitcher.